There's a popular hack out there that targets phones. It's a big scam recently, and this hack can cause you to lose your money in your bank accounts or have someone take over your social media platforms and so on. People will quickly assume that this happened because their phone was hacked. This is actually not a hack on the actual phone. What is hacked is your brain. What I will do today is to explain what the symptoms are of this attack and how to quickly respond to it to reduce the damage. This probably is heavily tied to the common use of two-factor authentication, otherwise known as 2FA. And the dependence of many platforms on 2FA has made this attack more common and more important. I will also explain my methods and why I'm fairly immune from an attack like this, even if they manage to trick me with a phishing attack. As I said, this is really an attack on your brain. If you're made aware of what the bad guys can do and a few extra procedures, you will not get hacked or scammed. So stay with me as we explore this. Here's the root of the problem. It's two-factor authentication, 2FA. Pretty funny because this was supposed to protect us from hacks and yet this is now the target of the attacks themselves. The actual process for the hack is that when you log into your bank account, you can click on forgot password and it will send you a text request with a code so you can reset your password. Same with social media. Let's say you have a big YouTube channel and someone clicks on forgot password, YouTube will then send a text verification code so you can change the password. All this looks pretty normal except if someone can intercept the text message and that's the real problem. There are actually several ways to intercept a text message. If you are important enough, someone like a government can read your text messages directly through the phone network using some monitoring software that can access SS7. This could also in theory be done by some carrier insider. But as I said, this kind of method of reading text requires carrier access and is only possible with governments and carrier employees. This is not the common threat for normal people. For the average person, the threat we need to address is called SIM swapping or another term is called a port out. This means that an attacker can take over your phone number and if it is done quickly, and you're cavalier about security procedures, you may not know that your phone service has been deactivated and is under someone else's control. At that point, the attacker then just goes to your known online accounts and does 2FA via texting to change passwords everywhere, and then you will be locked out. With a common sense understanding of what's involved, I can make you immune from this attack. The basic strategy to the SIM swap or port out attack is that the attacker calls the carrier and says he lost his phone and needs a new SIM card, but wants the SIM card to use the old phone number. This means transferring the old phone number to a new phone and new carrier. The carrier rep will then ask the attacker for information on the new account to verify identity. Many of you have signed up for service with a new carrier and many carriers don't really ask for much information to transfer a phone number. You can expect the usual questions, name, address, original phone number. Some carriers may want to do a credit check and may ask for a social security number. But since this is done on the phone or even online, commonly no real identity check is done with a physical ID. Then the phone number is transferred to the attacker's SIM card. At this point, the attack is easy to move forward. If the target is a bank account, then someone does a forget password and gets a verification on the newly transferred phone number. At this point, the original owner of the phone number is already disconnected from the phone network. And that will be the only indication of the attack. Another way of doing a SIM swap attack that's even easier is that the attacker partners with a rep at the carrier side. The carrier rep gets paid a fee and the SIM card swap is made. Maybe some cursory knowledge of the phone owner is needed, but this assures that there will be no questions asked because the insider is involved. Let's analyze this problem more carefully. Some key things. 
If you lose service with your phone all of a sudden, immediately think of all of your accounts, especially financial ones. Change the 2FA number quickly. You may also want to change your email to something completely different with a different 2FA so that the attacker cannot take over your email. This could be one of the first things done since email is going to be used for verification as well. This attack requires quite a bit of research before a move is made. First, the attacker has to know a lot of details about the target, like even the phone number and the email address. Enough information to convince the carrier that the port out or phone number transfer is valid. So this attack can easily be done by someone close to you. Typical attackers may be ex-partners, ex-spouses, ex-friends, and so on. These kinds of people would know your name, address, phone number, and may even know your account passwords. I know many people who experience this frequently and ask me for advice on how to protect their phones, but this attack has nothing to do with the phone itself. The attack is based on knowing a lot of information on the victim. In other words, this is actually a social engineering attack and the phone is just a distraction. The phone is also a toolkit to further the attack using 2FA, but at no time did the person need access to the victim's phone. The victim's phone does not have malware. There's nothing in the phone itself that's at issue. The only issue is that the attacker knew the phone number used for 2FA and knew enough personal details to convince a carrier that the caller is the owner of the phone number. So in general, think of the attacker as potentially someone you know and thinks you're worth harassing because of some animosity towards you. The other kind of attacker has a financial motive. This is the true scammer. The usual method of attack is called phishing or spear phishing. The standard phishing technique is more random and targets large groups of people first. Usually some enticing email or text is sent to you and you can click on it. You know, like the Nigerian scam. Once they know they can get you to click on things, then further efforts will be forthcoming. Spear phishing is an attack that is more targeted and is more believable. This occurs because the scammer already knows information about you online. One of the first ways to get information is to get a hold of the hacked databases of carriers, for example. T-Mobile was hacked and names, addresses, emails, and phone numbers were acquired. The scammer can also research you in social media ahead of time to get information about you in advance to create a more believable story for you. An innocent senior, for example, is easily subject to this kind of scam. And even young people can be made to click on things because they think there's a benefit to seeing the message. One very successful way to get younger people to click on links is if it somehow indicates a possible employer interest in the person. A scammer can pre-research a LinkedIn account and a Facebook account and then use references to real data that can make the person think that there is a legit employment opportunity here. People are also often scammed into clicking things because of fear, because the message may relate to a relative needing help and needs a quick response or some issue with the IRS or your bank trying to contact you. I'm going to get you into a mindset that will avoid you being tricked in a moment. The main clue though that you are being scammed is if you clicked on things and suddenly you're being asked to supply personal information. Or if they pre-research you, they may ask for additional information. I'll give you an example. Let's say the scammer has your name and address, but not your phone number. And you click on some link that shows your name and address. So you think it's legit, right? Then it may ask, please enter your phone number for verification. And you enter your phone number and the website responds that, yep, you are verified. In reality, it just stole your phone number. In general, if some click from some email leads me to a form that I have to fill out, then I will stop. Let's say the form is supposed to be from my bank. I will immediately terminate the form in question and I will go directly to the bank website 
and do things there, not from some link. If this requested form is not there, then I assume it is a scam. Spear phishing is more sophisticated now because they can just pre-research you like I said. Having some information about you already makes you think you have nothing to lose. Don't think like that. If someone ever asks you additional information, then that would immediately raise red flags in my head. For example, don't let anyone ask you for a PIN number of any sort. Let's talk about the specific ways to protect against a SIM swap attack or having someone take over your phone number for 2FA. In my case, this is extremely unlikely. This is because my phone, which happens to be my Brax2 phone, has two SIM card slots. The first slot is the number that is called by most people who know me, but this number is never, never, never used for 2FA. I explain in other videos why your well-known phone number should never be used for 2FA. It's because the various platforms have contact lists and can see the connections between people just by matching phone numbers in contact lists. It is another way to verify an identity. In my case, my Brax2 phone has a second SIM slot which I use solely for 2FA and no one knows this phone number except for the various internet platforms. It does not appear in any contact list and an outsider cannot know it because A, I never give it out and B, I frequently change it. In fact, I couldn't even tell you what my 2FA phone number is currently. I don't remember. I have to look at my phone to see. Because of my approach here, it is virtually impossible for anyone to do a SIM swap attack for 2FA use since the attacker is not going to know the phone number. This is very important to understand if you have ex-spouses and ex-partners that may harass you with a SIM swap attack, make sure you use a new phone number for 2FA, just like I did here. If you don't have a phone with two SIM slots, then use some older phone as your 2FA phone. But the idea of having a separate number for 2FA is important for privacy and also for cybersecurity. The attackers can still attack your main phone line in theory, but it is not used for 2FA, then there's little harm that can befall you. If you have the option, use other methods of 2FA like Google Authenticator or Authy. These apps are called time-based one-time password authenticators or TOTP. There's also a hardware version of TOTP and the most popular of this is the YubiKey. Using a TOTP method means you don't need a phone number. However, to be honest, in practice, many platforms do not support TOTP and platforms like Google require you to use TOTP or hardware TOTP devices like YubiKey using their Google app and that Google app still requires a phone. The Google app is actually tracking your device serial number and it's collecting more information beyond just the TOTP authentication. So these are not trustworthy options. For Google, I don't trust the use of any kind of software-based 2FA. So my method of using a second secret phone number is more generally useful in my opinion and insulates me against Google. It is good if at least some of your online platforms accept a YubiKey or an app-based TOTP authenticator, but unfortunately it will not be usable for all. Let's talk about the phishing attack for a moment. How can you know if a request to click a message is valid versus it being a phishing attack? Well, in general, if you didn't initiate a request, then you have to treat every link sent to you with a lot of suspicion. People send me messages with so-called secure messages or even links to look at some post elsewhere and I will tell you now that I will not click on the link sent to me. I will not open attachments. I may study the message using safe sandbox procedures to see if I'm being attacked, but just understand that an easy 90% of attacks in the form of phishing or malware are from attachments in messages and email. In fact, the Apple iPhone lockdown mode just prevents you from seeing attachments. You don't need any special procedure like lockdown mode for that. Just don't click. Next, always examine the domain of the hyperlinks. 
if someone is sending you some notification from wellsfargobank.com, are you sure it's not spelled this way? Or this way? Notice the meaningless text at the end there. That is not wellsfargobank.com. The domain is only the last two words in the URL, but before any slashes. Do you understand that a link like this is not valid? You need to exclude anything past the slash as being connected to the original domain. Sometimes the hyperlink is shown as a label like wellsfargobank.com, but when you run your cursor on it, you see a completely different actual link. It is difficult to see the actual hyperlink on a phone since there's no easy way to preview it like on a computer. On a computer, you can run the mouse cursor over the text without clicking and you can see the actual link on a browser. When in doubt, be a disbeliever. Now, admittedly, there are times when a bank wants to verify a transaction and I don't respond. But I see this as the bank's fault because in today's world, I have learned that I need to distrust to be safe. I don't respond to offers that are too good to be true. Many will contact me about opportunities because I have a YouTube channel. The chances of me responding to that are slim to none. Most of my communications for business are done on my app Braxme where I know I have preventive tools against malware. The carriers can offer you an option to attach a PIN number to the carrier account so that those without knowledge of the PIN cannot authorize porting your phone number to a different carrier. But to be honest with you, I cannot remember this PIN and it is just so inconvenient to remember because it is not attached to any other process. For example, it is not part of the login you could associate with a password manager. I have never remembered my PIN and the carrier still does what I ask. So I think they have a problem enforcing this. One of the more subtle ways to track misuse of your information is to have extra email accounts that can identify the validity of an email request. For example, I offer an email service, Braxmail, which gives you five domains. Let's say my email account is youtuber at braxmail.net and I also have youtuber at email1.me, youtuber at bytes.me, and so on. I can then make myself a rule that all my email verification addresses for financial use will be the domain email1.me. All social media will be bytes.me. And for personal communications, I use braxmail.net. I actually do this type of separation. So if I get a phishing attack from my bank on braxmail.net, then I know it is fake since I actually use email1.me for my bank. In the Braxmail example I use here, all the emails go to a single inbox so I don't have to lose any incoming messages. Because it is only actually one email account, it becomes easier to manage for this purpose. But this separation just allows me to determine if the message is legit. It is unfortunate that the internet has turned into a scamming nightmare. I don't even answer my phone anymore because 90% of the calls are spam. And my email has the same problem. However, with the kind of organization I've done with email addresses, I know that I will not get spam on certain email addresses because I don't give it out to the public. I've seen several YouTubers with big channels announce that they've been hacked recently. Just understand that with a proper mindset, proper use of 2FA procedures, good passwords which are stored on a password manager, then you will be protected. One final tip. Do not use the password storage offered by your browser. It's a stupid option. Use a separate password manager. Otherwise, someone can walk to your computer and start changing passwords to your social media accounts. In this video, I talked about a couple of products that may help you with your internet security. There's the Brax2 Privacy Phone, which is a dual SIM phone that's degoogled. And I also mentioned the Braxmail product. If you are interested in them, they are on my app, BraxMe. The link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.